Hi, very good morning. I'm Dr. Janak Patel, MD General Physician. Today we'll be discussing on one of the another interesting topic in cardiology that is pericarditis. Invariably, we also use an another word we call as a dry pericarditis. Pericarditis will end into pericardial effusion, collection of a fluid in a pericardial sac, and then it can end into constrictive pericarditis. But today we'll be discussing only on pericarditis. Meaning is very simple. It is involvement of the pericardial layer. And you know pericardium has got two layers, visceral and parietal. So inflammation of pericardium, we call that as pericarditis. Maybe because of infection or may not be due to infection, we call non-infectious. So any inflammation of pericardium, either due to infection or due to non-infectious causes, we call that as pericarditis. Depending upon the duration, it is divided into acute, subacute, and chronic. If duration is less than six weeks, we call it an acute, which include effusive and fibrinous variety. In subacute, between six weeks to six months, it can be effusive, constrictive, mixture of effusion plus constrictive, or maybe constrictive. And chronic can be effusive, adhesive, and constrictive. Duration more than six months. For diagnostic criteria, you need one plus. That is documentation of first attack of acute pericarditis with any one of the three, any one of these three, any one of these three, third, either one plus or two plus means person is having a recurrent pain, which is pericardial pain, with fever or with friction rub or ECG changes, or there is a pericardial effusion or there is an elevation of WBC, ESR or CR. Or person, you have demonstrated that person is having a first attack of acute pericarditis with any one of this. Then we label that as pericarditis. So presence of two of the following. Chest pain, friction rub, ECG changes, pericardial effusion, or elevation of CRP, ESR, or leukocytosis. So these are the five points. From that, you should have presence of two. You can see here, the pain is included here. And there is one separate term given, documentation of first attack of acute pericarditis. So, chest pain will be sudden. It will be localized to the anterior chest wall, mainly precordial region. Sharp pain pricking in character. Usually does not radiate, but if there is an involvement of the inferior pericardium, then it can radiate to left shoulder or to right shoulder. may improve if the patient leans forward and worse while lying down flat or by applying a pressure on the chest. That will be associated with presence of pericardial drop. Then we usually label that as pericarditis pain. So this will be the typical description of the chest pain. While on auscultation, if you get a friction sound, which is during systole as well as diastole. Sometimes we call triphasic rub. And it is heard with a diaphragm of stethoscope and at the left side of the sternal border. And 
that rub intensity increases by applying a pressure on the stethoscope because that will bring the two layer together or it is increased by bending forward that is typical pericardial drop and this rub does not disappear by holding breath and it persists then it is called pericardial friction drop there will be ecg changes there will be evidence of pericardial effusion on clinical ground or by demonstrable by echocardiography presence of fever elevated crp or esr or leukocytosis that is diagnostic criteria c reactive protein usually suggest inflammation cpkmb troponin may be elevated because there is associated involvement of myocardium along with visceral pericardium and leukocytosis also suggest inflammation or we call infection as far as ecg is concerned they are divided into four stages stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 and stage 4 in stage 1 usually it is from few days to two weeks where there is an st elevation with pr depression and this may be associated with rub or may not be associated with rub in state 2 it lasts for weeks st returns back to baseline and t wave is flat in state 3 again after 2 to 3 weeks there is a t wave inversion and in stage 4 it will last for many months and there will be t wave coming back to isoelectric line and it will be upright these are the four stages in pericarditis which you can demonstrate or you can get in ecg so st elevation with concavity upward and pr depression is suggestive of acute pericarditis in stage 2 st returns to baseline and t wave becomes flat state 3 t wave becomes inverted and in state 4 t wave becomes upright these are the four stages in ecg so st segment elevation because of epicardial inflammation which is best seen in lid 1 lid 2 avl and v3 to v6 and usually in lid avr you will see pr inter pr segment elevation and st depression because it is just opposite of limb lids that is lid 1 lid 2 and avr st segment will be concave upward smile pr segment is depressed in lid 1 AVF V5 V6 and T wave inversion will be seen when ST segment return, returns back to baseline in state 3 now you can see here that in lid 1 in AVL and V4 V5 V6 you have got an ST elevation with concavity upward you can see ST is elevated with concavity upward like this and pr segment will be downwards depress while in avr pr segment will be upward and st segment will be depressed very very typical in acute pericarditis again you can will be able to make out very clearly st segment depression with pr segment up sloping while in lid 1 avl sometime even in lid 2 st segment will be elevated with concavity upward and lateral lids that is v4 v5 v6 v4 v5 v6 you will see st elevation with concavity upward again typical you can see slight st depression 
ST segment elevation with concavity upward. In AVR, it will be depressed with PR segment upsloping or we call elevated. Similar changes you get in benign early repolarization. You will have to differentiate that. Benign early repolarization is with ST segment elevation with T wave upright and the ratio of ST to T wave is less than 0.25 while here ST segment elevation is more as compared to T wave. So the segment is greater than 0.25 here it is less because T wave changes are more as compared to ST segment changes. There are some words, common words which are being utilized in pericarditis. We call as an acute less than six week, subacute between six week to six month, more than six month chronic. Most common word utilized acute and chronic. We don't commonly utilize subacute. Etiology wise, viral is more common. Second common is bacterial than tuberculosis. But good number of time we do not identify the cause, then we call that as an idiopathy. And you can have a miscellaneous group of causes, which we'll be talking as we come to etiology side. Or you can divide into infectious, or we call infective, non-infective, or we call non-infectious. And hypersensitive or autoimmune. Depending upon the stage, we call it a dry pericarditis, pericarditis with effusion and when it heals, it heals by fibrosis in good number of conditions like bacterial, tubercular, radiation, etc. We call constrictive pericarditis. If it recurs again, we call recurrent pericarditis which is very common in malignancy or if there is one another term called chronic relapsing pericarditis. Depending on the type of the fluid, if there is a water which is being collected, this is mainly not the differential diagnosis of pericarditis, but mainly pericardial effusion. If it is pure transudate, we call hydropericardium. If it is effusion, we call pericardial effusion, which is mainly exudate in nature. Classical you get in bacterial, tubercular, viral, amoebic, etc. While transudate you come across in congestive cardiac failure, superior vena cava obstruction, hypoproteinemia and blood, presence of blood or RBC in pericardial fluid we call as malignant tuberculosis, very common in malignancy, tuberculosis, acute myocardial infarction, traumatic injury, post-surgical or in case of bleeding disorders. Rarely we come across collection of a fluid which is containing lot of fat or we call triglyceride. We call chylus pericarditis and it will happen if there is an obstruction to lymphatic blood flow, particularly if there is an obstruction of cisterna chyli and thoracic duct. So on onset, acute, subacute and chronic quantity of fluid, mild, moderate and severe. Distribution wise, circumferential, loculated. This is mainly for pericardial effusion. And composition wise, transudate, exudate, blood or chi. So water, hydro, exudate, effusion, blood, hemo and chi, chylothorax. And etiological classification, bacterial, tubercular, viral, radiation, malignant, amoebic, etc. There are different words which will come across as we come across. There are few terms we have already mentioned. Serous, fibrinous, purulent, hemorrhagic, caseous. These are common words utilized in acute pericarditis. We have told you. Acute, chronic, in chronic we come across constrictive and effusive or mixture of both together that is constrictive effusive. Means there is a fibrosis with little amount of fluid 
that is constrictive effusive variety stages wise acute pericarditis chronic relapsing pericarditis constrictive pericarditis if there is a rapid collection of a fluid we call cardiac tamponade or you can have some portion where there is localized and low pressure tamponade or you have got involvement of myocardium associated we call restrictive cardiomyopathy usually in acute pericarditis fibrinous and effusive variety is very common in subacute constrictive and effusive constrictive while in chronic usually it ends up with constrictive very rarely it is effusive or it can be adhesive when there is an adhesion to nearby structures that is adhesive variety chronic relapsing variety now etiology wise infective autoimmune neoplasm radiation traumatic idiopathic which accounts for almost 85 to 90% then drugs endocrine renal failure etc this is indirectly also the etiology in infective variety it is 2 to 5% only viral tubercular bacterial fungal fungal is very common antrogenic or in a person with severe immunocompromised host parasitic is usually spread from nearby structure like amoebic liver abscess which can rupture into pericardial sac producing amoebic pericarditis or amoebic pericardial effusion while bacterial staphylococci and pneumococci stands topmost on the list and second comes tuberculosis among viral coxsackie virus influenza virus hiv are most common in autoimmune disorders like sle drug induced lupus ra periarthritis nodosa scleroderma ankylosing spondylitis inflammatory bowel disease or maybe secondary due to post cardiac injury syndromes like post myocardial infarction we call dressler syndrome and sometime in post cardiotomy syndrome you can have a injury to the pericardial layer and that can end up with a pericardial effusion in neoplasm it can be primary or secondary metastasis or spread from nearby organ radiation pericarditis is very frequently when the person is receiving radiotherapy for ca breast or ca lung renal failure will result into what we call is a uremic pericarditis a traumatic injury will usually end up with hemopericardium like stab wound injury bullet injury or sometime a blunt non penetrating injury most common is idiopathic where we cannot identify the exact etiology and it is accounting for 85 to 90% second common is infective third common is we call malignant in india we should not forget in infective variety tuberculosis and hiv these are quite common and in immunocompromised host these are some of the common in among drugs hydralazine and procainamide and in endocrine hypothyroidism or mixed edema can end up with not pericarditis but with pericardial effusion there is one another word which is being utilized is auto reactive pericarditis where fluid contains more than 5000 mononuclear cells and there is a presence of anti sarcolemer antibody this is the most important criteria and inflammation of epicardial and endocardial biopsy you will be demonstrating by endomyocardial biopsy and you have to exclude active viral infection of both pericardium and endocardial layer by biopsy you have to exclude tuberculosis and other infection like chlamydia and bacterial infection absence of neo neoplastic infiltration again by biopsy sample and exclusion of systemic and metabolic disorders like uremia when you rule out all this condition 
and if there is a pericardial fluid which is containing 5000 count which is mainly mononuclear cells and there is anti sarcolemal antibody positive we call auto reactive pericarditis in a relapsing pericarditis there is pericarditis plus chest pain with any one of the following like fever pericardial drop ecg changes pericardial effusion elevation of wbc esr or crp and this is relapsing then we label that as relapsing pericarditis these are the criteria for acute pericarditis and myopericarditis means whenever the myopericarditis myocardium is involved along with pericarditis then we usually label that as myopericarditis and evidence of myocardial involvement is by elevation of cardiac enzymes like troponin cpkmb which are being elevated and you can demonstrate damage to myocardium with mri scan mri scan consistent with myocarditis that is mri with imaging scan that will be very clear cut evidence so myopericarditis is elevation of serum biomarkers and new focal lesions presume new focal or global left ventricular systolic dysfunction on imaging studies so that will tell you that there is involvement of myocardium pericardial effusion is accumulation of fluid in pericardial sac while cardiac tamponade is a syndrome where there is an accumulation of pericardial fluid space resulting in reduced ventricular filling and subsequent hemodynamic compromise this can happen because of two mechanism one rapid filling of even small quantity of fluid in a pericardial sac where pericardium doesn't get a chance to compensate by stretching or there is a massive collection of a fluid in a pericardial sac cardiac tamponade is one of the sequelae of pericarditis which will end into pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade and then when it heals by fibrosis it will end into constrictive pericarditis where ventricle is not allowed to fill because there is no elasticity left in pericardial sac effusive constrictive pericarditis means there is a little amount of pericardial fluid along with constrictive pericarditis so it is characterized by constrictive pericarditis with coexisting pericardial effusion and good number of time it can be associated with cardiac tamponade so there is a mixed hemodynamic picture of both constriction as well as cardiac tamponade then we call effusive constrictive pericarditis this is etiology we have already discussed infective etiology autoimmune neoplasm radiation renal failure traumatic idiopathic endocrine and drug induced you can divide into infectious neoplasm cardiac causes autoimmune drugs metabolic traumatic radiation we have already mentioned some of the common causes in previous slide at your leisure time you can go through the most common cause is idiopathic which is accounting for almost 90 to 95% viral and idiopathic will be accounting for almost 90% of the cases they also include autoimmune variety auto reactive variety and neoplastic variety in common out of which idiopathic will be accounting for nearly 85 to 90% so first possibility is always idiopathic second is viral third is malignancy and autoimmune so if you take this four 1 2 3 and 4 they account for nearly 95 to 99% of the cases so go through those particular groups they, together they will be almost 90 to 95% of the groups and rest like radiation traumatic injury drug induced metabolic causes etc 
the most common cause of relapsing pericarditis is idiopathy second common is viral third common is myocardial injury and pericardial injury syndromes particularly post mi syndrome we call dressless following pericardiotomy or following a traumatic injury then autoimmune and others are not very common so we call red as we go to the pathophysiology we know that pericardium is surrounded by the two layer visceral and parietal so involvement of both layer will be there very commonly in pericarditis so pericardium layer will be involved it is made up of a fibroelastic tissue so during systole and diastole there is a stretching and relaxation of that pericardial layer this elasticity will be lost when you start getting healing we result into constrictive pericarditis there is a visceral pericardium which is firmly closely attached to myocardium and parietal pericardium which is mainly made up of a fibrous tissue or we call fibro collagen tissue and mesothelial tissue pericardial sac usually contains 15 ml to 50 ml of clear plasma ultrafiltrate this pericardial layer is attached by ligament to the surrounding structure the function of pericardium is to limit the motion prevent dilation during volume increase and it does not allow any infective microorganism to enter into pericardial sac and it is innervated by somatic nerve when that is irritated it will give rise to pericardial pain we call pericarditis pain so it limits cardiac dilatation it maintains ventricular compliance it reduces friction between the two layer that is visceral and parietal and it does not allow microorganism to enter inside and it does not allow the heart to be displaced as far as mechanical function is concerned it limits the ventricular filling limits the extent of acute dilatation of the ventricle and even distribution of the pressure over the ventricle is balanced because of pericardial layer same what we have given before so it limits cardiac distension it facilitates the chamber coupling it maintains the pv relation of the chamber and output it maintains the geometry of left ventricle it lubricates between the two layer that is visceral and parietal and it decreases the friction it is a barrier to infection so it does not allow the microorganism it has got immunological function vasomotor function fibrinolytic function and it also there is a modulation of myocardial structure and function and gene expression very rarely there is an absence of pericardium it is absolutely rare absolutely rare but once in a while you can come across a person with absent pericardium because of infective pathophysiology or non infectious pathophysiology there is an inflammation secondary to inflammation there is a transudic formation which does not heal with fibrosis but if it is an exudate secondary to exudate you will have a more accumulation of fluid and whenever it heals it will heal by fibrosis and it will end up into constrictive pericarditis if there is a rapid accumulation of fluid in a pericardial sac it will result into what we use a word two words pericardial tamponar or cardiac tamponar if there is a gradual accumulation of fluid it allows the stretching of the visceral as well as parietal pericardium and it can accumulate a good quantity of fluid but when there is a very large quantity of fluid which is being accumulated it can also end up with tamponar particularly in tuberculosis 
when it heals you can get calcification so you can see calcification on an x-ray or on histopathology particularly in case of a tuberculosis by and large tubercular malignancy and parasitic can end up into chronic pericarditis malignant will usually end up into recurrent pericarditis so recurrent pericarditis is very common in malignant and tuberculosis while relapsing pericarditis we have already mentioned it will be common with in idiopathic variety or maybe because of infective groups so inflammatory process there is a influx of neutrophil and chemical mediators chemical mediators there will be increased permeability of perifas pericardial vascular which will end up into inflammation and collection of fluid there will be restriction of the heart motion and because of inflammation of pericardial layer you will start getting pain and you will have a little amount of dyspnea now this particular can heal but healing process can end up into constrictive pericarditis collection of a fluid in pericardial sac will give rise to what we call is a pericardial effusion rapid collection pericardial tamponade slow collection will allow the pericardial sac to stretch and accommodate large quantity of fluid particularly in malignancy tuberculosis traumatic injury hemopericardium etc it heals by fibrosis it will end up into constrictive pericarditis hydropericardium invariably will have a complete and full recovery we have already mentioned some of the condition will have a recurrent pericarditis particularly tuberculosis and malignancy while you can have a relapsing very common in infective pathophysiology it can be relapsing variety more common in idiopathy infection can spread from nearby structure like lung pleura mediastinal lymph nodes myocardium very rarely from aorta esophagus and liver particularly from liver amoebic liver abscess can rupture into pericardial sac so this is called contiguous spread from nearby structure the most common structure is lung and pleura then comes lymph node very rarely from myocardium it can spread to endocardium are sorry pericardium and very rare from aorta esophagus and from liver not very common spreads from blood in case of septicemia toxins neoplastic secondary metastasis and metabolic particularly uremia lymphatic spread is not very common but still you can have a lymphatic spread say particularly in case of tuberculosis traumatic injury and irradiation can produce direct damage to pericardium and produce inflammation inflammation will produce vasodilatation increase vascular permeability and leukocyte exudation we have already mentioned different types of fluid which can be there you can have a transudate particularly in case of a congestive heart failure hypoproteinemia in which you will have more of transudate suppurity variety will be more common with bacterial tubercular where leukocyte count will be high hemorrhagic variety will be more common with malignancy traumatic injury and rupture of acute mi ventricular aneurysm rupture or during procedures like pericardiocentesis or while doing pacing because of a traumatic damage to the myocardium 
sclerosanguinous variety can be there where you have got a serous collection along with sanguinous collection and in case of amoebic it can be encoviscous these are the different it will be chyle collection in case of a chylus pericarditis we divide into three stages early progressive and final what we call as resolving where there is an organization so early contains fibrinous protein pericarditis then it progresses further into effusive variety then there is an acute cardiac tamponade if there is a rapid collection but if there is a chronic accumulation it will accommodate slowly because there is a stretching of the pericardium and it can involve even myopericardium myo with pericarditis we call myopericardium and finally in some of the conditions it gets healed by fibrous tissue and there is a calcification calcification is most common in tubercular and final outcome in case of tuberculosis radiation hemopericardium there is constriction because of fibrosis we have already mentioned because of acute pericardial effusion there is increased pressure in pericardial sac which does not allow the ventricle to fill during diastole so there is a decreased cardiac output and there will be fall of blood pressure pericarditis is not very common but still you do come across pericarditis this is typical showing you a fibrinous exudate this is acute pericarditis you can see there is an exudative material exudative material it is also described as bread and butter appearance cheesy material this is fibrinous variety i'll skip this particular slide because we'll be discussing again in uh, what we call as pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade this is what happens in a cardiac tamponade this is end of expiration this is during inspiration and this is again during expiration what is happening we'll be discussing in detail in that chapter this is what we can get increase quantity of pericardial fluid increase pressure on right side of the heart decrease venous return poor cardiac output decrease in stroke volume and person can end up with cardiac arrest clinical picture presentation will depend on type of inflammation quantity of fluid severity of inflammation and speed with which there is a collection of a fluid by and large the person who presents with a dry pericarditis will have a pericardial drop and secondary due to that person will have typical chest pain pericardial effusion can be there with or without cardiac tamponade and then late stage you come across what we call is a constrictive pericarditis good number of time person may be asymptomatic if there is not a severe inflammation as a general symptom in a case of a infective pathophysiology fever is a most common we have already given the description of pericardial pain i am repeating again it will be mainly pain in the precordial region mainly on the left side it will be sharp pain pricking pain stabbing pain may be radiating to the left shoulder or to the right shoulder usually if there is an involvement of a diaphragmatic pericardium sometime if there is an involvement of a diaphragmatic pericardium person do get hiccups this pericardial pain is mild to moderate in intensity it may be aggravated by bending forward and applying pressure on the stethoscope 
because two layer comes together they will rub more person will develop pain as soon as the person starts getting collection of adequate quantity of fluid in pericardial sac two layers are separated they no longer rub against each other so rub will disappear and pain will also disappear along with this pericarditis pain person can have symptom signs of basic etiology like bacterial infection usually bacterial infection spreads from nearby structure like pneumonia or empyema etc so person will have a symptom signs of basic etiology if person from dry pericarditis enter into a stage of pericardial effusion now he will start developing symptom signs of pericardial effusion and in a late stage particularly in a sub acute or a chronic stage person will start developing symptom signs of chronic pericarditis or constrictive pericarditis very typical the person will have a chest pain fever dyspnea friction rub is audible on auscultation which will be rubbing in nature or we call friction sound which will be triphasic heard in systole diastole along with that you can have a st changes in ecg and once the pericardial effusion develops pericardial rub will disappear and pain will also disappear so for diagnosis you will have to demonstrate that the person is having any two of the above that is chest pain peculiar of pericardial rub on auscultation pericardial friction rub is audible stt changes in stage 1 you will have a st elevation with concavity upward and pr segment is downward down sloping or we call depressed in avr pr segment will be upward or elevated with st segment depression and st segment changes will be seen in lid 1 lid 2 lid avl and v3 v4 v5 v6 lateral lids on echocardiography you can demonstrate presence of pericardial effusion and there is an inflammatory biomarkers which are being elevated like crp esr and leukocytosis if any two of those are there you can diagnose that person is having pericarditis we have already given the description there is a retrosternal chest pain which is sudden in onset pleuritic in nature sharp pain pricking pain or stabbing pain which is increased by inspiration coughing or by swallowing it is worsen when supine posture and improves by sitting upright and leaning forward can radiate to neck or to the left shoulder radiation is to both trapezius muscle if phrenic nerve is in involved or irritated person can also have cough pericardial rub will be audible during respiratory cycle that is inspiration and expiration and pleural drop disappears when respiration person holds the breath there are three component pre systolic which is because of atrial filling systolic which is because of ventricular contraction and ventricular diastolic that is after second heart sound so it is called triphasic this is a description of a pericardial drop entirely given in detail that is quality location radiation duration relation to exercise relation to position then ecg finding and echocardiography finding all are mentioned you can go through your at leisure time because you can be asking oral 
So pericardial rub is in a pericardial region. It is three phasic, systolic, diastolic, and pre-systolic. It is leathery sound, scratchy sound. There is usually no conduction or no radiation. It is well localized and it is increased by bending forward and by applying a pressure on the stethoscope. We usually describe endopericardial, which is classical triphasic, pluropericardial, which is exopericardial, which can change the quality with respiration. There is another variety called is a conus and pneumo hydropericardium. If there is a collection of air and gas over the pericardial fluid, you can get a metallic tinkle or it is called as a mill wheel sound, which is a splashing sound because of the beating of the heart. This is absolutely rare, but if you get a pneumo hydro, hydro pneumo pericardium, usually we use the word hydro pneumo pericardium, then you can have typical metallic tinkle with each heartbeat. These are the different findings you can come across. Post infarct pericarditis, you can hear a pericardial drop after one or three days of MI because of inflammation of visceral pericardium. Dressler syndrome will be after few weeks, two months after MI. And this particular Dressler is very commonly because of autoimmune mechanism. This is a difference between MI, pulmonary infarct and pericardial pain. I am not going into detail at your leisure time. You can go through all the difference, location, onset, character, changes with respiration, change with position, radiation, duration response to nitroglycerin, pericardial drop will be present. This is again a difference between myocardial ischemia, pericarditis and pulmonary embolism. Again, myocarditis, pericarditis and pulmonary embolism. You can go through your at leisure time. This can be asked in your oral or as a short note. So you can go through at your leisure time. This is ST elevation in LVH, left bundle branch block, pericarditis, early repolarization, hyperkalemia, and STEMI. Just I'll go through little hurriedly. In LVH, ST and T segment, both are in opposite direction of QRS because whenever there is an LVH, you will have a LVH with strain where usually ST segment is down sloping. While in left bundle branch block, ST and T wave are both in opposite direction of QRS complex. And QRS complex is broad, more than 0.12 second. That we call as a left bundle branch block. And it will be RS, RDS pattern. In pericarditis, along with ST segment changes, you will have a PR depression and ST segment will be elevated. That will be peculiar in an acute pericarditis with concavity upward. While in early repolarization, ST segment will be elevated less as compared to pericarditis. In early repolarization, it will be 3 millimeter, while here it will be more than 5 millimeter. Good number of time. And you will have a notch at J point, which notch you will not see in case of pericarditis. In hyperkalemia, it is a narrow base peak T wave. So you've got a narrow base and both segments distance is equal. In STEMI, it is convexity upward with a wide upright T wave or inverted T wave. And there is a reciprocal STT changes in opposite limbs. And you will have a Q wave appearance. All these features you should be able to differentiate on ECG. So, this is concave upward, concave upward, 
this is convex upward in acute mi this is oblique straightening of acute mi this is concave like this you can see this concave in pericarditis and this is st segment elevation and pr segment will be down sloping down sloping This is acute pericarditis with early repolarization syndrome differential diagnosis. In early repolarization, you can see here, you will have a J point notching, notching at the J point. And you will see mainly in chest lids, that is V3, V4, V5. In those lids, you will see those early repolarization changes. Occasionally, you can see in lit 2, lit 3 and AVF. We have mentioned that difference in which lid. This is in V4, V5. Usually it is in V4, V5, V6. This is again a difference between pericarditis and pain of angina. This is acute MI where you get a convexity upward. Convexity upward, you can see convexity is upward and appearance of Q wave. So difference in acute MI and pericarditis, difference in ECG in detail. At your leisure time, you can go through. Investigation, mainly what you require is a good history. Auscultation for rub. And then comes what we call as an ECG finding. X-ray chest does not give you any idea regarding a dry pericarditis. But in case of pericardial effusion, ECG changes will be low voltage tachycardia. While ECG in case of an acute dry pericarditis, you will have a PR segment depression with ST segment elevation concavity upward mainly seen in lead 1, lead 2, AVL and V4, V5, V6. Stage 2, ST segment will come back to normal. T wave will flatten out. Stage 3, T wave will be inverted in and stage 4, T wave will again become upright. In X-ray chest, in case of a pericardial effusion, the size of the cardiac shadow will increase. And on echocardiography, we will be able to demonstrate the collection of a extra collection of a fluid in pericardial sac. In X-ray chest, in case of a tuberculosis, you may demonstrate calcification. And in case of constrictive pericarditis, the size of cardiac shadow will reduce. CPKMB troponin will be elevated in myopericarditis. RA test will be done if we are suspecting collagen disorders. Blood urea is important in case of uremia. CBC will give you idea regarding infective and non-infective pathophysiology. And once there is a collection of a fluid in pericardial sac, pericardiosynthesis and pericardial fluid examination will give you an idea regarding the etiology and type of fluid. Very rarely we require a biopsy, endomyocardial biopsy or biopsy from pericardium. There are some odd tests which may be required in a selective condition, particularly in a collagen disorders like RA factor, ANA, etc. And in case of a viral disease, you can go for RT-PCR, etc. In autoimmune antibody detection. So CBC will be useful in case of differential diagnosis of infective pathophysiology. ESR, CRP will help you to demonstrate that it is an inflammation. HIV in selected cases, RA factor, ANA in collagen disorders, blood culture or pericardial pericardiosynthesis and pericardial fluid examination to rule out the type of a fluid. Tuberculin test in case of 
tuberculosis, echocardiography to find out the severity of pericardial effusion, etc. So echocardiography will be very useful. This is an ECG we have already discussed. This is same what we have discussed before. We have told you that it will be with concavity upward or we call smiley and there will be associated PR depression. In pericardial fluid, it will be low voltage with sinus tachycardia and when there is increased pressure, invariably there will be large quantity of fluid, then you can have a low voltage with electrical alternates. Pericardiosynthesis with biopsy is very frequently required. Any person who has got pericardial effusion. X-ray chase, this shows mild increase in pericardial shadow or we call cardiac shadow. And for demonstrating a cardiomegaly, you require minimum 200 ml of fluid. This is adequate quantity of fluid. You can get water bottle heart. Clear cut. Water bottle heart. You can demonstrate on eco, eco free space. This is eco free space demonstrating pericardial effusion. You can see clearly. This is border of the heart. This is pericardial sac and you can see that there is an eco free space. You can see calcification very frequently seen in tuberculosis and other disorders also like sarcoidosis etc. Very typical calcification you can see. Again you can see calcification. Very very common in tuberculosis very very common. Yes, you will have to differentiate different groups. The most common is idiopathic, which is accounting for 80 to 90 percent. Second common is infective pathophysiology like tuberculosis, bacterial, viral or HIV. You should not forget malignant. So anytime if there is a fluid, pericardiosynthesis and look for the etiology. You will be able to identify that. You will have to differentiate in ECG difference between early repolarization, acute MI, hyperkalemia, as well as M, uh, what we call as pericarditis. We have already shown you before. Whenever a person gets a pain, symptomatic treatment and try to find out the etiology, treat the basic cause. And you should have a regular follow up. Sorry, here it should be P regular follow-up for complications, particularly like constrictive pericarditis. In symptomatic treatment, analgesics. Common analgesic utilized is aspirin, ibuprofen. Steroid should be avoided in bacterial infection, bacterial, viral, or we call infective pathophysiology. Steroid is strongly indicated in person who has got a very high chance of constrictive pericarditis, particularly tuberculosis, or after treating bacterial pericarditis, good number of time it can end up into constrictive pericarditis. Colchicine is also one of the drug which is very commonly utilized in recurrent pericarditis. In uremic pericarditis, you might need dialysis. And in neoplastic, you will read chemotherapy. You will require chemotherapy. And steroid is also indicated in a recurrent pericarditis. Recurrent pericarditis. And in malignant, you might require pericardiectomy. So relieve pain, treat inflammation, and prevent cardiac tamponade. That is the prime goal. So aspirin, NSAID, colchicin very frequently or you can go for glucocorticoid therapy where NSAID and colchicin does not give you a results. Immunosuppression in autoimmune disorders. Even you can use IV immunoglobulins. Pericardiectomy is required if a person 
is likely to develop constrictive pericarditis. So in that condition, pericardiectomy may be required and particularly in a case of what we call as a cardiac tamponade. We'll be dealing separately. These are the test and treatment for different varieties, particularly clinical indication of test and treatment. And these are the different conditions, idiopathic variety, infectious, acute MI, aortic dissection, neoplasm, trauma, uremia, etc. And what are the treatment? At your leisure time, you can go through. This is pericardiosynthesis, which can be done. This is parasternal approach. This is apical approach. And this is subcostal approach. So you are entering from zephysternal area. This is you are appro approaching into parasternal sp space. And this is at the apex you are approaching. So these are the different. And you can take the help of what we call as ultrasound guided. So these are the different techniques which are utilized during pericardiosynthesis. You can do even a pericardial drainage. The complication because of pericardial pericarditis is pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade and constrictive pericarditis. And in some condition, we do come across recurrent pericarditis, particularly in tuberculosis, malignancy and some other conditions like what we call as a radiation. Idiopathic also can end up with recurrent pericarditis. But the most common being malignant and tuberculosis. Well, you might require NSAID, colchicine, or when they do not give response, you might require even steroid. So recurrence is very common. Cardiac tamponade is very common. Constrictive pericarditis is very common. Sometime while doing a pericardi pericardiosynthesis, you can create a myocardial damage or we call as a cardiac perforation. You can end up with bronchopericardial fistula etc. Do remember this particular complication while doing pericardiosynthesis. So I end my lecture here. I am very thankful to you because you have spent some time with me. And this chapter will be very helpful because it is very frequently asked in your oral. And also you will come across as a full question in your theory. And occasionally you will see this group of people in your everyday practice. So I end my lecture here. I hope this lecture will be very helpful to you.